like scooping part of the brain out without having to go through. Right, yeah, because you don't need to be super clean about the brain. Welcome, everyone. Um, good afternoon. So today, it's a very special occasion. We are going to celebrate uh, Professor Yoko uh, Yazaki Sugiyama to be promoted to tenure full professor. And so before um, Jeff um, um, introduce Yoko, I just want to to summarize very quickly about the Provost Lecture Series. Uh, we started in October 2022, and uh, so the goal is to celebrate milestones in the careers of uh, always faculty members only. So we, we try to recognize newly promoted professors and also those receive uh, international awards. And so from this map, as you can see, the, our first one, um, was given by Professor Ichiro Mar Maruyama, who retired um, in late 2022, and followed by many uh, our colleagues who got promoted, and also those who uh, got pre uh, pre uh, prestigious awards. And uh, so this year in 2024, so we already went through uh, three lectures, given by Professor Takahashi, who also recently retired, and Yasha Neiman and uh, Satoshi Mitarai, who actually gave his lecture last Thursday. And uh, uh, so we encourage for the future um, uh, faculty members, yeah, please sign up early. So March is always a, a busy time. And so we appreciate everyone's support being here. And without further ado, I just want to finally thank again uh, so many people who made this um, uh, provost lecture series possible, especially people from Office of the Provost, people from the core facilities, especially in the engineering section, and people, all, all the members from um, CPR. So, so they, they're here every time, you know, recording the lectures and, uh, and also promoting the event. So, so thank you, and uh, I will let Jeff take over and for the introduction. Thank you, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to celebrate Yoko's promotion, and I'd like to provide a little background. Um, Yoko graduated with her PhD from Sofia University in 1999, and then she went to a postdoc at Duke University uh, in Richard Mooney's lab. And there, among other things, she made intracellular recordings from the zebra finch brain of neurons while playing them songs. Um, anybody who's tried that knows what a difficult technical achievement it is. Yoko returned to Japan and joined Takao Hensch in 2003 and uh, worked at the Brain Science Institute at Riken. Um, here she did important work that connected the maturation of the GABA interneuron system with criti critical periods for learning. Uh, then in 2011, um, she was recruited to OIST, uh, where she's continued to work and investigate the neural mechanisms of the developmental critical period. Now this critical period is a developmental stage during which sensory experience can shape neuronal circuits. Uh, for example, in humans, children learn to speak in their early years uh, at a much faster rate than adults, and they learn without effort, just from hearing the people around them talk. Unlike me trying to learn Japanese, I have to take 10 times as longer uh, as, as a child does. Now, this is well known, but the distinctive thing about Yoko's work is really her tenacious investigation of the fundamental mechanisms uh, that underlie uh, how experience is transformed into physical changes in the brain. Um, this requires great technical ability and pers perseverance and persistence, creative thinking to design tasks that integrate uh, behavior of birds and experience of birds with cellular mechanisms. And unsurprisingly, it's led to publications in nature and science over, over the years. And while at OIST, um, Yoko has also found time to contribute uh, towards creating the university, because it was very young when she came in 2011. 
Um, I won't list all the things that she's done, but um, I'd mention especially her contribution to recruiting Japanese students to the graduate program when it first started. Um, and as a member of the establishing board of the Child Care Centre to um, helping us set up the policies and also communicate them uh, to the Japanese people in the, in the community um, and making it consistent with uh, the standards uh, around. Um, she also contributed to refinement of the um, childbirth accommodation policy for students um, and served as a member of faculty council. Uh, as well as being a supportive and very helpful mentor to, to numerous students. Um, so now I'd like to ask Yoko to tell us about singing in the brain. Okay, thank you, Yoko. Yeah, thank you, Jeff and Amy, for the super kind introductions. Kind of amazing that it's already 12 years has passed since I joined in here. Um, we have been working on the development, so hopefully we also have developed in 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 here. So I've been super happy for you know, working in here. First, I have to connect the computers. Okay, good, coming. So yeah, I want to introduce, okay, so today I want to share with you that the, what we have been doing. Hope you can find something we developing in here. So I think everybody's believing that they, I'm working on birds. But I, do be, I think that the, not many of you know that the, why we are working on birds, why it's beautiful and then here. So they're singing like in that way, but they cannot sing when they are born. So they have to learn to sing like humans learn to speak. It's really similar in many of the ways. So you probably take too much granted that you can speak, right? You don't remember when you learned to speak, but you did it. Congratulations, you did a great job, right? So everybody did it amazingly well, but it's interesting that we don't get the any rewards for doing that, right? You don't get the any candies, you don't get the anything, but you still can do it. Right? And then even you don't get the any punishment. Right? It's lucky that the, you, know, you, don't, you don't, if you don't speak, you get the you know, punishment from your parents, don't, you know, it happens, but it's still you could do it. So it's really amazing. Think of the other animal the behavior experiment. I know they have been doing so much training thing. So you have to give the rewards to the mice. You have to give the punishment to the, to the rats. Otherwise, they don't learn. But our birds just be together with their parents. They can start to sing like we do. We start to speak just by naturally by healing of the adult speaking, try to communicate. So being in a society, try to communicate, it's already a reward to, to, their, to their animals. Right? Because we are living in the societies, we want to communicate. It's a huge reward for communicating with the others. Right? So that, to understand that, this is the really good modeling animals, because they are learning to speak, they are learning to think, like humans are learning to speak. But also it's really interesting, it's happening only in the developmental period. It's developmental period, it's matching faster. So even after hatching, even after born, we are developing so many skills, right? So the human speech skills, communicating skills are really cognitive skills, really high cognitive skills. But to get to these high, you know, higher cognitive functions, we have to develop the relevant skills earlier. So the functional development is not happening randomly. It has to happen in the specific sequential manner. To get their good speaking skill, good communication skills, we have to have the good motor skills. We have to talk, right? But to get their good motor skills, you have to develop the good sensory skills. Unless you have the good sensory, you know, the sensory detection skills, we cannot get their good uh, motor skills. We cannot develop the good motor skills. So to develop the nice, you know, high, higher cognitive, higher skills, you have we have to develop the you know, relevant skills. Nice, like a nicely orchestrated manner. But to understand that skill, we need a good modeling. So you probably don't understand that the human speech even need their, this you know, nice like a orchestrated like a development. So as Jeff suggested, Jeff already telling that the human speech skills also depending on their this like early development of their auditory skills. It's kind of already a famous story to, in the songbird field that the Japanese cannot distinguish L and Ls. Actually, I cannot. 
I, I, made a, I make a so much mistake from the spelling of L and L's. You can pick that they, my proof of you know, the being Japanese. But it, interestingly, what they found is, like, what the people already found is that they, if even if the Japanese infants, if it were the early period, it's really early, like a six to eight months old, they, you know, they can distinguish the, these sounds almost the same level with American infants. It's really good. But they are losing these skills while American infants increasing these skills when they're getting to almost a year old. So that is really telling that the dairy, this early period, what they are doing, what we are doing is developing our detection skills. So Japanese baby normally hearing Japanese sounds, right? And then developing our skills to detect the older sounds which is sitting in Japanese. So I can distinguish the ame and the ame really well. Probably you probably didn't hear the differences. Right? Hashin and hashi is different for, for us, but our L and L are not different. So our detection skills are de you know, is developed to detect the older Japanese intonations and then sounds and the bowlings, which doesn't have a in the difference of L and Ls. And then once getting an adult, we start to learn English and then try to hear the, you know, the English sound by using our detection skills, our auditory detection skills. So that's a reason that we cannot detect the, the English world really well, why the American infants who train the, the, their uh, detection skills with the English sound, they can distinguish. So that's the limitations. Even we can learn the new vocabularies, we have some limitations because of this auditory skills. So the, that's a reason that we want to know that the why, when, the development is happening, how it's orchestrated, and how we can develop these co you know, cognitive skills. So we have been interested in how this de like, the sequential development is happening, why this time window is limited, but then we need uh, some good modeling. Right? So to do that, Songbird is a really good modeling. As they learn, first there are the healing of the adult singing, Normally, in this species, only bird sings as a codesip songs. So they first healing for the father song and then memorizing it. And then slightly later, they start singing by themselves. And then this moment, they healing their own song and then try to match their own vocalization to memorize father song. And then finally, they develop their own song. Right. So in the ones becoming adult, they are singing really beautiful song, but they are using this song as you know, attracting to females. So it's really highly cognitive skills. Right. So as you see in here, they are nicely matching with the you know, cognitive development of the humans. Right. So by looking at that, like, uh, by looking at this behavior, we try to understand what is happening in our brain. So first I want to show that, you know, I want to convince you that they are really developing the songs. This, you, know, it can, you can hear that the, how their song you know, sounds like when they are baby first. So they are, when they start singing around a month old, their sounds more like in that way. <laughs> you see more like a super noisy, doesn't sound like a song, right? But then they keep practicing like a human baby babbling. And almost a, at the, almost a month later, they sing, they sing more like in that way. You can hear it's becoming more you know, complex, becoming a, more like a rhythmic pattern. But then still not perfectly you know, like stereotyped, but once becoming really adult, it's becoming more like in that way. You can hear that the repeats of the some phrase, and then it's more like a stereotyped. So that's, that's honestly the, the, the one words you know, developing their sound over the months by keep repeating of the, you know, keep practicing the songs. So as you see in here, they, are, you know, they start to get really noisy sound like a human baby bubbling and then development. But also if they see their father song, you see they are really similar. Even looking at the structure, you can see some structures are kind of copying. So you see it's a sign of learning. So they, we, don't, we didn't do anything really special, just by together with the father, they try, they're kind of mimicking it and then develop their own song. So now you hope you understand the, you know, how they're developing in their song. So then by looking up what is happening to brain, we, we try to understand what is happening. But it's, as I say, this is really a natural behavior. Birds are learning to sing just by hearing of the father's song. 
So we can ask, it's, it's naturally happening. Even just going to the wild, it's really happening. So because it's a really natural behavior, we can ask so many biological questions sitting in there. Like they are learning only in the developmental period, as I say, so we can understand how this time window is developed. Also, they also uh, they, they learn only through the social interactions. They are not learning from the speaker playback. They need to interact with the uh, like a living you know, animals. So why it's happening? You know, the, why it's only happening through the social interactions? But also that the why it's happening only through the conspecific animals, the same species, not happening the close species, right? So we can ask those kind of interesting biological questions one by one. So I want to introduce some of the story we did in, in these past 10, 12 years. So, the, so first we want to, uh, I want to show that the what is happening, how they are detecting their own species song. So this is the project the, done by the uh, first postdoc, Makoto Alaki, but also that the, we are, you know, we are in the OIS, we can collaborate with the totally different field of the people. So we, I, we are collaborating, uh, we collaborate with uh, Professor Bandi at that moment. So the, as I said, that the birds are, okay, we are learning to speak, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of gene we have, right? They, they have to speak in any case, right? But it, doesn't matter what kind of gene, you can learn any of the languages, right? Just by depending on the experiences. Even my parents are Japanese, but if I heard the, some like English, French, Chinese, I would speak other languages. Right? But I can learn any of the languages, but if baby birds, baby here that, you know, communicating with dog, they never ever learn to bark. It's really natural, but you see many of the time like they are communicating really well, but they, you never see that it's happening. Right? Why? Why we know that the, it's dog barking? Somebody telling that, the, okay, this is dog barking, you, dog barking, you shouldn't tell, or you shouldn't learn, or the, you, when you're t t talking to baby, did you tell that, the, oh, that's human babies, the human adult talking to you, you have to learn now. Nobody tell it, but the, somehow we could tell this is human speech. It's really true for the songbird too. They are in the woods, think of the woods, they can hear a variety of the sound, right? It's including the, the voices from the other species bird. But still, zebra finch can learn to sing from zebra finch sound. It's really important to them because they have to attract the zebra finch females, otherwise their courtship behavior doesn't work out. But nobody would tell the zebra finch babies that, the, okay, this is zebra finch singing, you have to learn it. But somehow they can learn from zebra finch parents. Why it's happening? How they can detect innately their, their singing? That was our first question. Here, especially these species, it's really interesting. So because they are, we have a variety of the birds in there. It's looking slightly different in here. But if you hear their sound, one sings different songs. Actually, this is really important. They're, they're, this uniqueness is really important because it's, it's their identity, individual identities. They're, even they're learning from father, they somehow differentiate from father because it's their identities. So if the, even the hundreds of birds, uh, uh, thousands of birds sitting in there, each one sings their own song. It's really important. But when they think of the babies, baby birds hearing of the zebra finch song, still they can hear zebra finch, they can detect all of them as a zebra finch song and then try to learn them. And then when they try to learn from one of them, they can try to differentiate. So it's really amazing uh, biology sitting in there. So they have to balance the individual uh, differences, individual valuations, also the species identities. So how they can balance within you know, how they can balance these two competing ideas. One is divergence, one is convergent, right? It's, it's different ideas, how they can balance. So that was our question first, and then what, try to, you know, for, try, uh, for answering that questions, what we did is that the, we just raised the zebra finch baby with the other species bird. So this is the, another species bird called Bengalese finch. It's uh, really similar, but it's a different species. So if you hear their song, this is. 
So this is Zebra Finch's song. And so this is Bengali's Finch song. It sounds slightly different, right? You can, you can feel, again, we probably cannot say how it's different, but you can feel it's different. So what we did is that just stealing the zebra finch baby just, just after hatching and then place into the Bengali finch nest and then isolating them in the sound intervention chamber. So under this condition, the zebra finch babies fostered by Bengali finch can hear only Bengali finch song, even their zebra finches. Right? So for entire life, they just keep hearing Bengali finch song. So under these kind of super crazy conditions, Zebra finch babies develop this kind of song. So I can play back. So you can hear that it's becoming similar to Bengalese finch. So even the, you see that uh, even the uh, sound spectrogram, you can see this is coming from that one. You see uh, this structure is similar to that one. So you can really identify that the syllables are copied from Bengalese finch foster father. Um, when looking at the others, uh, many of the, the birds raised by Bengalese finch, and then just looking at the, how many syllables are copied from the Bengalese finch father, they, in a good, good fraction of the, the elements are copied from their foster father. So it seems they are really learning. But we could feel that this still sounds like, somehow sounds like a zebra finch song. So we wanted to really identify why it sounds like a, a zebra finch still. So then we also take a look at the, uh, how the, the, their temporal, like a song temporal pattern. So to look at the temporal pattern, we just you know, simply measure the duration of the each syllables, but also the duration of the silent gap in between. So just, you know, just look at recording a bunch of the uh, uh, zebra finch song and the Bengali finch <laughs> song, also the zebra finch raised by Bengali finch song, and then measuring the duration of the syllables, duration of the gaps in between. And what we found is that the zebra finch normally has kind of two types of the syllables. One is kind of shorter syllables, the other is a longer syllables, while Bengali's finch song, like a Bengalese finch song has kind of shorter syllables only. But once the zebra finch babies are raised by Bengalese finch, their distribution of the duration of the syllables are becoming more like a Bengalese finch. It's really true, right? Because they copied from the uh, Bengali finch uh, foster father the syllables. The duration, like the distribution of the duration, is becoming more like a Bengali finch. But uh, when we look at the silent gap in between, what we found surprisingly is that the normally zebra finch silent gap is shorter when comparing to the Bengali finch. But uh, even they copy the syllables, how they align these syllables into the you know some rhythmic is more, still more like a zebra finch. Oh, sorry. So they can keep this timing. Even they copy the, the, some words, the timing, how they sing this syllable, is still more like a Bengal, uh, zebra finch. So we are kind of joking that they, they are singing the Bengalese finch song with a, a zebra finch accent. Right? The rhythm is still more like a zebra finch. So that is really suggesting that they maybe they are using this one as an innate coding of the Bengali, uh, zebra finch songs. So to prove that idea, we even go into the neurons and then see whether they are detecting this temporal pattern. So to do that, we're just simply recording from the neural activities. So the, I know that not many of the, you are the, the neural scientists, so we can measure the neural activities. So neuron has the activities, which is basically the information to sending to the other neurons. This is really important because the neurons are sending the information. That's the way of they are doing the calculations. So we, their, their, their signal is basically the electrical signaling. It's really tiny electrical signaling. So that's the reason that the, if we insert the electrode in the, is a closer to the neurons, we can prove these electrical signals. So here I just showing as a last step plot. So you have to believe that this one line is the one spiking activity, one like an activation of the neurons. So you, and like a, a activation of the neurons when we play back these sounds. So if even we keep keep uh, play back the sound, neuron get the fire. So we can believe that this uh, this neuron is kind of responding to our song playback. So as you see, what we found is that the this, like this brain earlier, we have two types of the neurons, and then both are nicely responding to the, uh, to the zebra finch song playback. But when we play back the white noise, they stop responding.
just showing the kind of onset response, and then other than okay, later they stop responding. So okay, well, at least we can see that there, this new one can distinguish the white noise and the zebra fin song. But interestingly, when we play back this song, it's not called song, right? But they, we just cutting this white noise into pieces and then make a time alignment more like a zebra fin song. So it doesn't have acoustic feature of like a song, but they have the rhythmic pattern of the song. Right? So if when we play back this song, we found that the one type of the neuron start to respond as more like a zebra fin. So it's seeming like a, this neuron is detecting only the temporal pattern of the song. If the, note, the white noise is continuous, they stop responding. But if it had the temporal pattern more like a zebra fin song, they're still responding. And interestingly, that neurons also respond, uh, did not respond to the other species song, but also if we elongate the zebra fin song, putting more like an extra space in, in between, they also stop responding. So suggesting that this new one can detect the temporal pattern, which is innately encoded to the zebra fin song. So maybe this is the, you know, within their brain, what we could see was that the you know, one neuron can detect the morphology of the kind of more like a sound, like a sound feature of the, the elements, but we, they, they do have the neurons which is detecting the temporal sound of the songs. Right. So then this, like a, maybe this like a, uh, acoustic feature is representing their you know, individual varieties, while the other, like a temporal one is detecting, the, is you know, representing the species identities. Even they have the different, you know, the sounds, the different, uh, different words. This temporal pattern is still within the, you know, some range of the zebra fin songs. So amazingly, their brain is much better than the computers. That's the Mahesh Bandi saying that the computer normally they have to have the header and the to identify, to say something, right? So here you have to identify that the, okay, the following information is saying the information of the species. But what zebra finch brain is doing is just kind of putting this cord into, you know, dividing Dylan and the one, and the one is is representing the uh, individual variety, but the duration of the zero is encoding the species informations. So just by even they hear the one song within there, there are two information is implemented. One is the, the individual varieties, the other is the species identities. Just if you're hearing what kind of sound they are producing, it's showing the uh, variations, uniqueness of the individuals. But just by hearing of the temporal pattern rhythm of the songs, they can hear that this is a zebra fin song. So it's really amazing way, and that we can find that this is the way they are detecting the two, uh, the two independent information in one song. So that's a one story we, we thought. Um, so that's, what, that's what's happening when they're hearing of the song, when they, are, when they are detecting the sound for memorizing. So the following question we wanted to see is that the, how they are forming the memory, where they are forming the memory. This is the first step they have to do it. So because we wanted to see the development, so we, we, we try to go one by one. So first, we want to see that they, how they are forming the memory. So for that one, so another uh, postdoc, Sinya Nagihara, did the chronic recording from the neural activities and then see what is happening when, they are, when, they are, uh, when birth, uh, baby birds are learned to sing. So what he found was that the, after hearing of the father's song, you know, after memorizing the father's song, we could find some neurons which selectively responding to the father song. So we play back the variety of the song, like the one song, their own song, like a father song, their own song, or the other, uh, other zebra finch song. But before learning to the tutor, because we isolated from the father, we couldn't find any new loans specifically responding to the tutor song. But once they hear the tutor song for days, we could find some new loans, not big fractions, but the, some new loans highly selectively responding to the father song. So seeming like they are forming the memory. It's not a big fraction. Even after this, we could find only the tiny fraction, only about 15%. But even if it's a tiny, if we didn't, if the birds didn't have any uh, experience with the tutor, we couldn't find these fractions. So we can, uh, we can believe that this is probably the memory trace of the, the, uh, of the father song in the brain. 
So this study is even expanded by the, uh, uh, to see that the why it's happening only through the social interactions by the other, uh, uh, the other uh, postdoc, Yelena Kadik. So what she was really interested in was that, the, as I say in the beginning, that the zebra finch can learn to think only through the social interactions. They can memorize the father song when only the case when they are healing of their father singing. So it's really true that the, you know, as I say in the beginning, that the, we cannot distinguish English sound of Ella and else. And then some of you probably thought that, the, oh, maybe you have to pick uh, maybe DVD or something to your babies. But unfortunately, it's already proved that it doesn't work. I'm sorry. But <laughs> so that's, but also that I have to say that it's not happening only to Japanese. It's happening to everybody. So they did their extended study even to the American infants, and they found that the American infants cannot distinguish the Chinese Mandarin sound. So it's fair. It's happening to everybody. It's fair. So science is fair. You have to believe. So if they are raised by the English condition, they cannot you know, detect the Chinese Mandarin sound. But if they are raised, even if it's American, they are, if they are raised by the uh, Chinese, like if they are exposed to the Chinese uh, sound with the right condition, with the living tutor, they can uh, acquire the ability to detect the Chinese Mandarin sound. So it's really telling. It's not the, you know, depend on the gene. Later, it's have, uh, it depends on experiences. But this experience has to happen through the social interaction with the living animals, right? living humans. Because even the, if they are exposing to the just DVD in there, even humans sitting in there talking to babies, it doesn't, it didn't work. Right? So it has to come through the social interactions. So it's, it's really true for the songbird too. Really old, even the really old paper is showing that the they can learn to sing from the tutor, the live tutor. As I say, we don't need anything. Just being together with the tutor, healing from tutor singing, they can learn. But if there's a visual barrier in between, they stop learning. Of course, if just from the speaker playback, they don't learn. Why this is happening? Maybe just a conversion with the visual and the auditory? That's a one idea. But one interesting paper came out almost two decades before. So in there, what they did was putting the you know, tutor decoy and in this behavioral paradigm, only their case juvenile birds pick the liver, which is sitting next to the, to the decoy, you know, giving uh, like a uh, triggering the song playback, tutor song playback from the speaker, which is sitting on the decoy. So then like, each time the like, juvenile birds pick the button, they can hear the sound. So, and then during this condition, juvenile birds learn to sing, like mimicking the spe even from the speaker playback. But in this condition, as you can imagine in here, that the juvenile birds can hear the tutor song playback with their own timing, with their own motivations. But you, they know when it's coming because they trigger the tutor song playback. So that's really suggesting that there maybe their motivation or attention will be helping. So that's our idea, wanted, you know, which we wanted to test. So to understand the where, the, how the motivation or attention would help, where we, where we try to focus is the local cellularis. This is a terrible name for Japanese. You see like starting with the L, so many L and the Ls. So I hate this place, but still we needed to work on there. So it's really concept earlier as attention control earlier, project into every area in the brain and everybody's working. So let me just say LC, because it's easy to, to say it. So we decided to see this earlier because we also learned that this LC is projecting to the auditory area where we found the memory is formed. So now we can see that the, this is really good power with some, even the mammalian systems. So now we can see that the, whether this input from LC, you know, we, which we believe that they more attention control, is, uh, is controlling the memory formation of the juvenile birds when they are healing to tutor singing. So to that first, of course, we, you know, she confirmed that the, you know, even she can, you know, she can uh, find that the increasing of the tutor, uh, tutor selective neurons by healing of the tutor singing. Even she could find that the, you know, exposing to only one hour, two hours is good enough to develop these like a tutor selective neurons. 
But then we want to see whether this development of the tutor selective cells is depending on this activity of the LCs. To understand what we have to do is that the manipulating the LC activities, LC input tutor, these auditory alias. So what we did, okay, we have to use some like a specific tools which called the optogenetics. So look at, um, this is the kind of the tools developed in the neuroscience field. By shining the light, we can manipulate the activity of the neurons. So what we did is that the manipulating of the terminal of the, the LC uh, input to the auditory alias. So, and so each time birds are hearing or the tutor singing, we inhibit the activity of the input from the LC. So even their hearing, the, the activity of the LC is in a, uh, inactivated, so it doesn't work. So in that case, what we found is that the, even their hearing of the tutor singing, we couldn't see the development of the tutor selective neurons. So it is, it's a good contrast with the you know, control experiment, which we don't, the neuron didn't, uh, didn't get the effect of the shining of the light. So okay, we see that there is no increase of the tutor selective cells, and then, of course, it's it, it's important to see that the whether this whether this uh, these birds could learn from tutor or not. So we just raise the birds until the adult, and then see whether they they learn from tutor. So even the, so, then we see that the, if they have the exposure to the tutor, but if the activity of the LC is inhibited. They didn't develop the tutor selective cells, but also they didn't learn from tutor. So suggesting that, it, so they go, even communicating, when communicating to the father, the communication, visual input, auditory input coming together is, is important, but it's not directly important. It's important to activating their motivation, they're activating their attentions. So that might be the reason that they can form a memory in their brain. So then they can, uh, they, can, uh, they can mimic in later. So again, we, we wanted to see in the beginning that they were they are forming the memory, but as again, uh, what I say now is that first they have to form a memory, and then later they have to practice by guiding, by getting the guiding from the tutor memory. Right? So we wanted to see that the, how this memory is guiding the later period of the motor, you know, uh, motor learning, but what we have been known so far is that the, even we could find the, the tutor, memory, uh, tutor selective neurons, which we believe that the memory of the tutor some uh, traits in the auditory area. So far, we didn't know that the, whether this area is connecting to the uh, more like a motor areas, which is necessary for singing or even song learning. So we wanted to see whether this neuron, this area is connecting to the motor area. But what we knew is that this neuron is really small proportions. So we really wanted to target those neurons to see whether they are connecting to the motor areas. But unfortunately, we don't have a good tools. So neuroscience is kind of the amazing field. We have been developing so many interesting tools, so many cool tools, but most of the tools has been developed in the mice conditions. So we cannot use this technique directly in birds. So we have to utilize, we have to tweak uh, the, too much with the, the uh, bird conditions. But uh, luckily, we have really nice like, a technician, our super technician called Yuichi. He has been here for, in my lab almost 10 years, and then he has been developing a new technique in our, in our lab. Okay, even we can uh, use a, a tissue clearing technique. He has been developed the virus, uh, the virus tools, which is fitting to the songbird. So then we have been utilizing the uh, uh, viral vector tools in the birds. Actually, our lab probably is the, the biggest lab for using this like a technique in the songbird field. We are kind of providing these tools to the, all over the world. So like, anyway, so we, he developed the one of the really good, uh, 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 good uh, virus tools, uh, collaborating with the, the Dr. Hiyoki in Junten University. So in this virus, we can, uh, by using this virus, we can express the specific genes in the neurons which are getting activated. So by using this technique, I don't, I don't go into the details, but by using these virus tools, we can express the G, uh, like a, some like a fluorescency in the neurons which are getting activated by healing of the tutor song playback. So we can see that the, which neurons are getting activated by hearing of the tutor, uh, tutor singing, and then where, uh, where they are projecting to. 
So to do that, of course, we didn't know that the where this neuron projecting to, right? So then we have to know where in the whole brain. But to that, we needed some good tools. So luckily, I had some like extensive work in the WPI project in the U Tokyo, uh, U -Tokyo uh, University of Tokyo. And then in there, another a, a good talented uh, researchers are helping, uh, working uh, together us. And then they develop the tools for you know, tracking the whole brain uh, tracing within the tissue, cle uh, the create tissues. I can play the video if, oh, where, where? Where's my mouse? Where? There I go. I can pray. Why it doesn't work? Hmm. I have to go to there. Oh, why? OK, good. OK, I can pray the video. Doesn't work. Oh, here. See, like, this is a whole, like, a half of the brain. You see neurons are sitting in there, and then like, you see the fibers are running through their uh, many of the places. And then even we can do the axon pro like, axon registrations and then see where they're projecting to. It's an entire brain. It's kind of amazing technique, but they, we somehow made it. So okay, by you know, getting that information, we could see that the neurons are projecting into their, to their area where they're, uh, where they're kind of controlling the motor activities. It's premotor earlier. earlier. But amazingly, what we found is that they are projecting to the motor earlier only in the juvenile period. And then once it's getting adult, they are losing these connectivities. So, the, they, so this is kind of motor earlier. You see many axons sitting in there, but they're not happening in the adult period. So what we could think from there is that the, you know, during the developmental period, even the brain network connection is one time, oh, sorry. One, hmm? Sorry, I don't learn. I, sorry, I haven't learned how to use a computer even this like a 10 years. Right? So I can, so we are not the board. We are not young enough, unfortunately, sorry. But uh, what we found is that they are projecting, they are making the connection only to some specific moment of the time during the developmental period. And then they are detracting the projections. They are disconnecting the, you know, the projections. That's also suggesting that there may be this Axon connection, this connection is shaping the time window of the critical period. We still want to keep expanding this idea, still you know, keep working on that one. But I, you know, like, like, summarizing in my talk, like, we are working on the songbirds because we want to know how our brain circuit developing, how our brain function developing to get the really high cognitive functions. So you hope, hope you can believe that this is really good monitoring animals. We started from the auditory earlier, the like auditory phase, how they are getting the information, how they process, how they are guiding the later period is the early stage. So now we are expanding that, that, that stage to the later stage, how they are, you know, how this early stage uh, like learning will instruct the later period. So we, uh, um, so how this time window is developed. So we can uh, we can try to answer a variety of the questions. But of course, we are also glowing, and our lab also has been glowing. We have the first like, PhD student just you know, getting defense last month. Um, so hopefully, and then we also, we also know that we are learning through the communication, as I say. And I'm super happy for being in here. I'm collaborating. So now even our lab has been collaborating one number of the people. But we also know that not just for the official collaboration as noted in here, Every day communicating with you, discussing with you has been uh, enormous. I, I learned a lot. I'm super happy for being in here, working with all of you. It's, it's, it has been really nice. Thank you so much for your attention and happy for keep working with you and then happy for taking the question from them. So we have time for some questions. Come over here. Just, yeah. um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so from what I seem to understand, having this visual um, component into um, to learn the song is really important. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's too far away, but babies that are blind can still learn how to talk. Mm -hmm. So how is it still, is it, 
diff is it a different? Do you expect a different mechanism for human babies? Are there blind birds that can still learn how to talk? How? Yeah. Yeah, I think like uh, even like uh, they they don't have a, I mean, like, uh, as I said, the visual input itself is not important, right? If the visual if the visual something is there, it triggers their attentions or motivations, right? So like, uh, that idea sh should be the same. So like uh, social interactions, like, uh, interacting with them is just like tapping with them something. Just you can feel even you don't see it, you can feel that the, somebody is sitting and there. It's drawing the attentions, right? So this kind of mechanism, I can't believe that it is still the same with the human and the songbird case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, very interesting talk. And my question is related to the, the reward. So you said that the songbird uh, does not get any reward, but it's still practicing. Mm -hmm. So then in case of the generation of the song, so after first kind of a <laughs> frame is generated mm -hmm. for the perception, mm -hmm. then probably, I don't know, but the song but practice to something repeat what I just uh, bars remembered, right? Mm -hmm. But in that case, uh, are there, there any intrinsic uh, reward? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, if I can sing something mm -hmm. similar to my memory, I'm happy or something like that? Yeah, yeah we do believe, I mean, like a reward that the, you know, we don't get the, any like artificial yeah. reward, right? Good food or something. But the, we believe that the for them, even to us, that the, because we can't, we are not living alone, right? We have to be in the social. So like being together with the other animals, other individual itself is already a reward. So healing of the singing itself should be a good reward to them. I think the communication is more like in that way, right? So interacting itself should be a, good, a big reward for the... Yeah, but but the, however, my knowledge is that uh, in uh, baby children, first, once got framed, mm -hmm. then without further... Yeah, yeah, they can, can do it, yeah. So therefore, in that part, there is no communication, mm -hmm. but still... Yeah, yeah, like, uh, for forming the memory, like, that's the reason like, we say that it, it's kind of the sequential manner. First, they have to memorize it. So yeah. it's, uh, they need some, like, some templates. But once they are making the templates, what they have to do next is they have to practice by themselves. Right? In that case, they're making more like a their rhythmic motor pattern. That in that moment, they need or any more like a new input from the father because they already made a templates. So then they're doing the template matching. Mm -hmm. so that part is not so much social. No, not social. They can practice even by themselves. Okay, right? thank you. Yeah. I want to uh, oh, okay. Uh, in your result, you found that some neurons in the HVC projected to HVC mm -hmm. are contributed to the sensory learning mm -hmm. during the critical period. We hope so, in yeah. HVC, I think it can have many neuron cell types. Do you know which cell type? Projected we, to HVC during the time. We want to know. <laughs> yeah, that's the next step we want to we want to see. Like, even I, I just gonna make the story short, so I, I didn't say that this they're projecting to the other area too. So I can't not perfectly saying that, that this only this projection is needed. Maybe the other projection also will be involved. So the, our next step actually there, Joanna sitting over there is doing that the what cell type is you know projecting how what kind of information they are sending when it's needed. So this is kind of the following question we are now tackling with. And, uh, during the critical period, the, there is some such kind of neurons mm -hmm. from NCM project to the HVC, mm -hmm. but in the adult it disappeared. So can we see that the memory from HVC will transfer it to mm -hmm. HVC by such kind of means? Yeah, that's kind of interesting question. Like everybody is asking that, okay, where the memory forms, right? As I think it's uh, related to, to Jun's uh, question that they, they are forming the memory in the beginning. That's just my idea. They're forming the memory. It's uh, auditory memories. But when they are try to sing, they have to have their own motor templates, which should be quite different from, not quite, but there's some, some, something different from purely the auditory memory of father. As I say in the beginning, that the father song and their song are similar, but they're not identical. They have to have their own motor skills. So may, that might be the reason they have to dissociate the auditory memory and the motor patterning. But the memory is not, idea is that the memory is not placed only one place. Maybe they are spraying. Maybe even they move based on the, depends on the time of the, during the development. 
and I remember the Toad Grove in the University of Texas mm -hmm. published some research maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. They found that the NIF has yeah, yeah. similarly uh, maybe rules. What's the difference? We don't know. Yeah, the NIF. We believe that the NCM to, to HPC, uh, HPC is more for the Tudor memory, right? But the NIF is, the NIF or the other earlier projecting to there is more like a motor patterning. Right? As I said, like auditory memory and the motor patterning will be, will be different. So like a, then like a, for the motor practice, their goal is becoming more like their own kind of stereotype patterning, right? So like a, when even they are hearing with a Tudor, their goal is not perfect copying the father. They have to have their own motor templates. So that might be the, the way coming from NIF or the other areas. That's my guess. Yeah. Thank you. Yoko, we often hear that memory is not a copy. It's a reconstruction. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering if you think there might be some reconstruction elements that might contribute to the variation mm -hmm. in the song from the tutor to the learner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, reconstructions. We haven't tested that, that idea. I don't know how we can do. It's more a theoretical. Yeah, a yeah. Potential theoretical explanation, but just that you know, when we remember events, we're not actually remembering the event. We are create. We are reconstructing. Yeah, yeah, event, yeah. And we experience it as memory. And I just wondered if that might be something that also happens in situations like this. That might be true. What we saw, we have been so, uh, well, have been thinking, it's like a, they're, actually they're moving the places. Like a one earlier, we could see that the, this kind of responsiveness in the juvenile, but the ones going to adult, we couldn't see it. So maybe like a baby went transferring to the other place. This kind of thing might happen. But I still, I have no idea how we can test this idea. Yeah, Gelder. Yeah, Gelder. Yeah. Yeah. Related to. Yo's question and also like the technology that you develop on AAD mm -hmm. is that I mean you have half the system for doing TED tag there you know uh -huh. uh, have you are you considering doing a TED tag does tetracycline work in in birds so you could actually mark the memory engram and if you do the memory engram then you can do exactly what Gail says that you can think actually get the memory from the tutor mm -hmm. and also of the learner and then you can actually compare neuroanatomically after you clear the brain if these are similar or not. Yeah, we did, yeah, we, we actually we are using the TED you know, TED on system, right? For yeah. tagging their activated cells. Yeah. You just have to put the channel rhodopsin so you can actually affect it. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing we try to do. And then actually the we if we we can use the tether on and off together, and then we can label in the different type of the cell. You know, play back the one song with the on condition, and play back the other song with the, the off condition. We could see the kind of different group of the cells are expressing the different colors of the fluorescence. Well, I'm thinking combining like I mean the, the Tonegawa type experiment, yeah, yeah. either with channel rhodopsin or dreads. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean that's the thing we are trying to do. That of course, like, again, like, we have to tackle with like okay, how much they express. I just don't know whether your AV is good enough that spreads wide enough that yeah. you can actually do that. I don't know. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's that's my question. Mm -hmm. So another follow up to Gail's question. <laughs> so um, do they ever sing along with the tutor? So the human human beings learning languages, particularly human beings learning musical instruments, will, will exactly copy in, in real time what yeah. they're trying to learn. Do the songbirds do that? They do. They, I mean, they do sing by themselves, and they, they practice a lot. Yeah, that wasn't quite what I was asking. Do they sing along? Do they try to synchronize singing the same notes with the bird? Because that, that's what you do if you're learning a tune. What we know is that they... they Yeah, during the juvenile period, their songs still had a huge variations, right? Because one time to the others, they are practicing. But what we know is that the one they are singing to females, it's becoming more like a stereotype because they, they have to sing more like a precise way. But to them becoming alone, they're, be they're becoming more plastic. So maybe that's the moment they're trying to kind of matching. That's the reason they try to 
they're trying to choose variation and see what's the kind of best match with the templates. I don't know what that's we can guess. That's a point you're asking? Not, it, not exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it would, so I'm thinking about humans. Success of approximation. Yeah, yeah success of approximation. So, so Gail's, Gail's um, remark really reminds me of a lot of things in learning music and instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 you play yeah. and you approximate what you've, you've heard. And if you want to really knock into what you, you're copying something mm -hmm. exactly, transcribe it or you play along with it and make sure that each of your notes is in register with the thing mm -hmm. that you're trying to learn. So I was just wondering if there was an equivalent learning process with birds where they check the register with the tutor by singing at the same time as the tutor. Yeah, we know that they are doing, like so far we haven't, like we, nobody has you know, found their kind of ALR signaling or like a copying of their like a matching signaling because if they give the what we believe is that the, if they are have on time compilator and then giving the kind of LR signaling if destroying it is kind of uh, modifying these activities they should change the activities so those kind of things didn't happen I mean so far we haven't found yet but the, we know that the, if we compromise some of the brain earlier like a NIF constantly then they cannot do the matching. So we can't believe they're doing this kind of matching one time. And like a, even they have like a multiple syllables on there and then giving the, uh, this kind of artificial stimulation only one note and they mismatch only these specific notes. So seeming like a not entire, they just give one to one signaling. So it's really suggestive that they even some like a rhythmic activity or some like a specific notes to notes in what like a LR signaling is coming. But it just we just haven't that they haven't found that where it's happening in the brain. But it, we believe that it is a similar <coughs> kind of practice they are doing. Just one more, yes. What is the advantage of a critical period? Uh, wouldn't it be better if you just remain plastic and adaptive? And then you have to forget everything. <laughs> It's plastic it because it sounds, sounds really cool, right? Because we want to run something new. But the, you have to know that the, you know, kids learn to learn something, but they're also forgetting really easily. Right? So we, we acquired some skills, but the, we, then we want to consolidate. Right? So if the new low wiring is always plastic, we can acquire the new skills, but the maybe two days later, you have to forget. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> okay. okay. I think uh, just before we finish, I have to present yep. the present. <laughs> uh, have a uh, and it says, uh, to Yoko, in admiration of your relentless experimental efforts and outstanding progress towards understanding how experience shapes brain development. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. for your healing to like, coming to here today.